Fifth annual Medical Education Day, sponsored by the Academy of Distinguished Medical Educators. Uh, my name is Helena Bruckner. I have the privilege of being the director of the Academy. And I'd like to begin by just telling you quickly about what the Academy is and uh, what the Academy does. Uh, the University of Chicago Academy of Distinguished Medical Educators was established five years ago um, with several core missions. The key mission being to elevate and celebrate the importance of medical education in our academic medical center. So the missions of the academy include promoting excellence in teaching in the Prisker School of Medicine and the medical center as a whole, to support scholarship among medical educators, both to disseminate the innovations that um, we are so proud of and also to help support the careers of our medical educators, to enhance the Pritzker curriculum by supporting, recognizing, and um, rewarding its outstanding teachers, very importantly, to build a community among the medical educators um, in the medical school and across the medical center so that there's a, a common um, uh, way of uh, interacting with people who do things similarly, even in different settings. And most importantly, to facilitate the creation of, of an environment that enhances the status of medical educators at the University of Chicago and nationally. So how do we do this? The Academy has several activities um, that have been ongoing for the last five years. First of all, the recognition of outstanding faculty teachers. And I'll get back to that in a minute, but this afternoon we will be uh, recognizing six uh, new fellows in the Academy and three new masters, uh, faculty members who have shown by their example and by their leadership um, outstanding ability and devotion to teaching across the spectrum of medical education. The Academy uh, helps to fund educational projects that support and enhance the Prisker curriculum as well as the curriculum in graduate medical education in conjunction with the GMEC, which is the Graduate Medical Education Committee. Um, this is the, my opportunity to, uh, for the first time, announce the, uh, the RFAs uh, for the uh, uh, educational grants that are available. If you look in your books on the very last page, it describes the request for application process uh, for this year's series of grants. Uh, the process um, is that uh, the uh, applications will be available uh, starting tomorrow and uh, are due at the beginning of January. Uh, the funding is up to $25,000 a year for up to two years, with half of that uh, supplied by the Academy and the GMEC, and the other half matched by the departments. And these grants are for um, research and innovation in medical education across the spectrum. So you'll hear more about this officially, but um, you'll see also this afternoon that previous recipients of these grants from the Academy and from the GMEC have done marvelous work in many areas. Those recipients um, who are presenting, all of them are presenting posters and they're labeled with a special um, designation in the book and at the poster session. Um, the Academy also supports uh, various faculty development programs throughout the year and that's one area that the Academy hopes to uh, grow. Last year, uh, most recently, we had a very uh, specific but very useful session for faculty on how to use our survey tool to do effective surveys uh, within medical education. And finally, and today most importantly, the Academy sponsors Medical Education Day, um, which is the one day a year, one of the, the, the days in the year that uh, medical education is front and center at our institution. So I'd like to uh, invite you to participate in all of the rest of the day. We just came back from a very productive and provocative retreat for the uh, clerkship and program directors focusing on supervision across the medical spectrum of education. Uh, we'll have our keynote address in a, in a couple of minutes uh, by Dr. Polanski. And then from 2 to 4 p.m. in the uh, fourth floor atrium of the uh, Center for Advanced Medicine, 
We have 60 posters representing a wide variety of activities in um, undergraduate and graduate medical education as well as um, other areas of education including global health and community health. Um, after the poster session, four of those posters will be presented, have been chosen to be presented as oral abstracts and uh, the details are in your book and you can see uh, up there, but we certainly hope that you'll be there both to support the faculty and students who will be presenting and also to participate with your questions and comments. And then at uh, 5.15 or 5 p.m. or so, we'll have the award ceremony uh, followed by a reception. The uh, award ceremony uh, is in order to inaugurate the new fellows and masters of the academy. And I'd like to just uh, mention who they are. Our three new masters are Diane Altcorn, Adam Seafew, and Mindy Schwartz from the Department of Medicine. Masters are recognized for sustained and um, uh, sustained contributions of excellence to medical education. And we have six new fellows, Kathy Bachman from anesthesia and critical care, uh, James Brosson from the uh, Department of Neurology, Jeannie Farnan from the Department of Medicine, Barrett Fromey from the Department of Pediatrics, Carl Matlin from the Department of Surgery, and Sarah Ann Schumann from the uh, Department of Family Medicine. And fellows are recognized for their ongoing excellence and contribution to medical education at the University of Chicago. So we'll begin with our keynote address. Uh, we're delighted to uh, welcome Dr. Kenneth Polanski, uh, who uh, has agreed to speak to us about the central role of education in the Academic Medical Center. Many of you have probably heard Dr. Uh, Polanski's biography uh, before, and you can read it in your books. Uh, Dr. Polanski uh, came to the University of Chicago after medical school. Uh, and did his residency at Michael Reese Hospital and then um, joined the faculty at the University of Chicago where um, over the ensuing uh, years he became the section chief of endocrinology um, and uh, professor of medicine. He left about 11 years ago to assume the uh, chairmanship of the Department of Medicine at Washington University in St. Louis where he built an already uh, very successful department into, into one of the premier departments of medicine in the country. And we were uh, delighted to uh, recruit him back to the University of Chicago and welcome him back as uh, Dean and um, Executive Vice President for Medical Affairs. So um, I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming and, uh, Dr. Polanski and looking forward to uh, your address on the central role of education in the Academic Medical Center. Um, so I was delighted to get this invitation and um, I really enjoyed meeting the new uh, fellows and masters. Uh, last night I was extraordinarily impressed with the uh, quality of the work, the creativity and the diverse areas of interest. So I thought that was really uh, very impressive. And I, I think as you know, um, education is a very important uh, function at the University of Chicago. We take it very seriously. So you can know that from my own personal experience here. So, so as you know, I came here as an endocrine fellow, and then um, after that they decided, for better or worse, that I was uh, appropriate to be a member of the faculty. Uh, and uh, then they decided, well, you know, maybe, maybe not so good, so we'll make him uh, section chief of endocrinology. And so I then am now back as dean, as you know, but the one position that I was never able to get was to be a resident in internal medicine. So I did apply here uh, a number of years ago. In fact, um, when I was uh, in South Africa and wanted to come to the United States, I applied to the University of Chicago for the medicine residency. So not only was I not accepted, I was not actually even given an interview. So, so what you can tell is from my own personal experience that it's easier to be the dean than it is to be a medical resident. <laughs> Uh, at the University of Chicago, so uh, maybe that'll give, be some encouragement or discouragement for people who are, are residents here. So um, 
What I'm planning to talk about today is some of the views that I have on medical education. I'm not going to talk about undergraduate education or graduate education, and that's not because I don't think they're important or because uh, I've forgotten about them. I haven't. Uh, it's medical education day, so I assume that that's what we were going to be talking about. And also, um, you know, as I thought about what I was, uh, you know, how I was going to talk to you, um, I, I've viewed myself throughout my career as a very enthusiastic participant in education and certainly as chairman of the Department of Medicine, a very strong supporter of education in our department. I always viewed it as absolutely central. Uh, but I certainly don't put myself on the same level as our masters and fellows as, as a superb educator because I haven't participated to that extent in, in education. It, it was never the, the, the central role that I played. And so um, what I thought I would do, uh, because I think it's uh, maybe helpful for you to see how I'm thinking about education, and uh, the comments are not meant in any way to be advice or gratuitous because they're not, uh, when I, so, so I, I thought about some of the lessons that I've learned, which I'll go over with you uh, in the, you know, approximately, well, it's almost 30 years now that I've been in academic medicine and the views that I have of education. And then I, I sort of summarized them and jotted them down. And then I went to the website uh, for the Pritzker Initiative and the School of Medicine. And I was really encouraged to see that many of the ideas that I have are actually quite consistent with the ideas that are going on here. Um, so I think that's good, but I'll, I'll tell you about them. Uh, and then what I think you'll see is that a lot of the things that I'm going to say I think are relevant to residency programs because obviously as chairman of a department of medicine, that was where my a significant part of the effort, it wasn't just in residencies, uh, was involved. So um, I chose the title uh, of the talk uh, intentionally and thought that maybe we should start by going over why do I think that education is central? Uh, because, you know, as I said, it really is. Uh, so first of all, it's a cultural thing, and uh, education is one of the main drivers why many of us, if not most of us, are here. Uh, and, and that is a very big draw, uh, you know, particularly for people who are active clinicians. Um, in many ways, it would be easier to practice clinical medicine in the community. Uh, and the big uh, draw to the University of Chicago is the joy of teaching uh, medical students, residents, fellows, etc. And I must say, uh, you know, in the 11 years that I was a chairman, uh, the thing that most of the faculty enjoyed the most uh, was their time that they spent. They never anticipated being on service with great um, enthusiasm, but once they were on service, they always said, I had such a spectacular time. Uh, the residents were great, the students were great, I really enjoyed it, it was very invigorating. So it's very much part of the culture. Um, now clearly it's central to research and that's obviously one of our other missions. Uh, and as you all know, the vast bulk of research uh, that is done at any academic medical center is carried out by uh, people who are in training. Um, and if we didn't have outstanding trainees, we wouldn't have outstanding research. Uh, patient care, another obvious uh, reason why it's central. Um, the quality of care in any academic hospital across the country, and obviously including this one, uh, is dependent on residency coverage. And even though we have uncovered services now, uh, without outstanding residents, our patients don't get good care. And then the final, uh, well, the final two uh, are that the students and trainees are really the best ambassadors that we can have at the University of Chicago. And I think we need to be very important, very careful about that um, because if you think of the large number of trainees that are on campus over here and many of them move around to other places, um, the, the uh, potential to have both a positive and a negative impact on the reputation of the University of Chicago is influenced most uh, directly uh, by the effect that we have on our students and trainees. And so if they leave and move on somewhere else but are well satisfied and have good feelings about us, uh, it's a huge advantage compared to the opposite. And then the final is that uh, the trainees should really be uh, a farm system uh, for our faculty. And so if we can attract outstanding trainees, uh, train them well, uh, we should be proud to have uh, at least many of them on our faculty. And I think that's a tradition here as well as at many places. Now, I think you all know <coughs> that uh, there is intense competition for the best trainees. Uh, and this is, it's really uh, very difficult. Our competition uh, is uh, obviously substantial. They're outstanding institutions. Uh, and so we have, in order to be competitive, we have to be sure that our training programs are outstanding. 
uh, that we offer very interesting and creative choices to the trainees. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was stimulated last night to just realize that we need to think about creativity in education in the same way that we think about it in research. So it's obvious that if you want to get a research grant, you have to be creative. You have to have novel ideas. You have to be uh, thoughtful about it. You have to have good data. You have to think about the, the problem in great detail. And I think that we need to do the same thing. And again, I'm not saying that it's not done, but I'm just telling you the way I feel um, about our educational uh, uh, programs. We, we need to have exactly the same type of rigor and uh, commitment to creativity uh, in education. Um, the environment uh, needs to be welcoming and supportive. Uh, it's essential that morale is high and the trainees are, are pleased to be here. Um, every residency goes through its ups and downs. We certainly had uh, in our department in St. Louis. And I can tell you, the years that there were problems because we changed the call schedule or somebody left or there was some issue in the residency, it was much tougher to recruit uh, a, a new incoming class at the same level. Um, and the, the, the best recruiters are the trainees. Uh, you know, they'll come and they'll listen politely to the faculty, but the people that they really take into account are what the residents or the students or the, their, their peers tell them. Uh, and if they're unhappy and critical, and as you know, young people don't hold back, they're very, very honest. Uh, uh, so it's absolutely critical that we have an environment that is welcoming and supportive, that morale should be high, and the trainees should be pleased to be here. Uh, the trainees should be diverse and from different backgrounds, and that's clearly an absolutely essential component uh, of a, uh, an exciting training program. Uh, so from all different aspects, if we can get people from other countries, uh, different backgrounds, different points of view, people with different interests, uh, it makes for a very exciting uh, place in which to train. Um, the trainees need to realize that we care about them and that we provide them with good uh, career advice and help in finding their next positions. Uh, there's nothing more disconcerting for a trainee that they reach the end of their, trainee, their training and no one has sat down with them and said, you know, what are you interested in? Which are the good programs? We'll write some letters for you. Uh, we'll help you get to the next uh, place. And uh, the impact of that, which doesn't take an enormous amount of time, uh, is absolutely enormous. And there's no question that it has profound impact uh, positively on young people's careers. So that needs to be incorporated uh, into, the pro into programs if it's not. Um, upon graduation, it needs to be clear that the training has been outstanding. And I mean, I can tell you that when we place students, residents at outstanding places for fellowship, for uh, uh, residency training, uh, they give us a couple of chances. And if after a couple of years they've had a few of our students and they've not done well, uh, then they don't let them in again. Uh, and so one has to be sure that the training has been outstanding and that the people are well placed. Now maintaining excellence is clearly important, but it's much easier to maintain a good reputation than to repair a bad reputation. And so our efforts uh, to be con need to be consistent and there's really not much room for error, uh, both in medical student recruitment and certainly in residency recruitment. And the annual residency and medical student recruitment drives need to be well-run marketing campaigns. I mean, the, 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 the days need to be organized well. The lunch needs to be, you know, the food needs to be at least adequate. Uh, people, <laughs> pe people need to be well-treated. Um, and and I can t we used to do exit interviews of all of the people, um, actually after they'd gone, uh, everybody who came to the program who, d who we wanted, who decided to go somewhere else, got a questionnaire. And um, it was actually extraordinarily helpful um, because they provided, obviously they had nothing to lose. Um, they didn't have to sign their names, but they all were happy to because they were going somewhere else. And um, they provided us with enormous feedback. And, and there were things like the person who interviewed me came in and hadn't looked at my file. And I can't tell you the negative effect that that had on many applicants, uh, that, that, the, that the person who was interviewing them hadn't taken the trouble to say, to know that they came from the University of Florida and that they'd got a, MD in, uh, they'd got a, a, a degree in biochemistry or wh whatever it was. Um, so there are these simple things, um, knowing what you're going to do. So everybody knows that there are changes in the work hour rules. Um, one needs to be able to articulate the plan of what's going to happen next year. 
Uh, and if you say, well, you know, we haven't really thought about it, we're kind of thinking about it now, we're going to decide in a couple of months, uh, it, it, it doesn't go well in comparison to a program that says, you know, we know that there's a change in the work hour rules and this is our plan, this is how much call you're going to have, this is how we're going to deal with the problem. Uh, and, and so I think it's the same sort of rigor and, uh, you know, careful planning that, go, that hopefully will go into everything that we do that needs to be a part and parcel uh, of our training programs. Now, how, so, so the issue really becomes, how can we stand out as an outstanding place to train? So clearly the University of Chicago is outstanding. We have uh, a lot of advantage uh, in our overall eminence, uh, impact, and the reputation of the institution uh, by virtue of our faculty and the quality of the faculty, the quality of the research, the patient care, the facilities, and the academic environment. Um, but as you know, there are other places that are equally good, or at least they don't know that we're much better than they are, but at least to the outside world, we, we, we seem to be at a similar level. Um, and so one has to really work hard at looking for program enhancements that will improve the quality and increase the appeal. And trainees these days, as I think we all know, are really idealistic. Um, they have a global view of things, uh, and they want to have a lot of choices and a lot of interesting things to do when they come. And that's what they expect. So some of the themes in which I think uh, are very helpful in differentiating our programs, and as I said, you know, some of this will pertain, a lot of this will pertain to residency pro training programs, but some to medical student uh, training as well. Uh, and I've, I've put what I think are the six uh, most uh, important, and as I said, when I looked at the website, I realized that that I'm sort of preaching to the converted, but I'll, again, give you some of my specific thoughts about it. Um, so let's start with research. Obviously, the passion to create new knowledge, uh, scholarship, how we term it, uh, is a central focus of the University of Chicago, and it is one of the great institutions for learning uh, how to create new knowledge. Um, so the focus should p permeate all of our training programs. I think we have to uh, uh, convey to the trainees that we have a great respect for scholars, people who are able to, con to uh, produce new knowledge. And the mechanism can take various forms. Um, so, so the one is, obviously, we want to train people who are going to be scientists and scholars. Uh, and that's, we have many programs uh, that deal with that. Um, but obviously, a, a, I mean, a minority of our trainees, even at a place like this, are going to become uh, academic physicians. So even for people who are not interested uh, in research or scientific careers, I think that it's critical uh, that they get exposed to the scientific method in real time and in, in detail uh, as an insight into evidence-based medicine. And I'll talk about this in a moment. Um, the academic enhancement of the program uh, does provide the opportunity to work with faculty one-on-one. -on -one. So there are two programs that we had, and I know there are variations on the theme, and I'll, I'll just tell you about them uh, because I, I think that you know, these are the type of things that, that are, are really important. So we created something called the Physician Scientist Training Program, and I know that Skip Garcia, we started about 10 years ago, so when he came, he did something very similar, and, and I found it to be extraordinarily helpful. So, so what this was, um, was to try and recruit people who really were destined for a research career uh, into the residency in the Department of Medicine. And so we had a separate uh, track and a separate um, uh, interview day. They, the, the, the applicants would come uh, the day before. Uh, we, we had uh, recruitment, just a, recruitment every Friday for about uh, 10 weeks. And so the afternoon before, we, we would put, advertise that we had a program like this, and we would get about 70 MD-PhDs who would apply to the program. Uh, extraordinary people, uh, just unbelievably strong. And we would interview about 20 or 25, um, and these are people who would um, destined, I mean, they had all of the, the basic um, tenets to be able to come, to, to become outstanding physician scientists. And what we found was very helpful was a couple of things that, that I think uh, made the program very appealing. So the first was we guaranteed anybody who was uh, accepted into this program a slot in any of the fellowship programs. 
And in internal medicine, that's a big deal in cardiology and in GI because those fellowships are extremely um, competitive. Uh, it was a little bit of a push to get those uh, section chiefs to agree to do that. Um, but in the final analysis, they did. And we were a little worried that all of the people would want to go into cardiology. But it turned out to be a, a very good mix. Um, and so, so that was a good, uh, a good thing. And it, it attracted some people who wouldn't have otherwise come uh, to our program. The second thing that we offered um, was that people could have, uh, they could train in any lab uh, in the university. Uh, and that was another big deal because uh, many of the, the sections uh, would have preferred to have these MD PhDs train in their own labs within that section because obviously the faculty wanted them. Uh, but the idea was that the scientific training of these young people was what was paramount, that the parochial interests of the, sec of the section should come secondary to that. And if somebody wanted to work in, for somebody in the chemistry department, uh, in the undergraduate campus, or somebody in uh, you know, the cell biology department to round out what they'd already done scientifically, then they should have the opportunity to do that. And so I think that was a very important thing. And, and it turned out that it was a good decision because a number of these uh, young people chose to work in eminent faculty in other departments. Uh, and obviously, they were still part of the fellowship. Um, and then we were able to recruit them back to become faculty uh, in the Department of Medicine. And they'd had a very broad scientific training that they were able to then use the techniques that they had learned to the benefit of the department. So although there was a short-term compromise because uh, during the period of training, they were working in labs in other departments, in the long run, I think that this was really a, a very good thing to do. Um, and then we, the, the final thing is we did um, provide them an additional uh, amount of money during the time that they were in the lab uh, on the understanding that they wouldn't moonlight. And uh, you know, I understand the realities of life. People have loans. They have kids who are at school. They have tuition to pay. They have a variety of different things. Uh, but we said to them, we want you to spend the time in the lab. We don't want you moonlighting so that you come the next morning and you're asleep at the bench. Uh, and so we paid about $15,000 a year uh, incremental salary with the understanding. There wasn't a contract. It wasn't a legal document. But there was a contract. Uh, there was not a contract. It was just a, 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 an understanding uh, that they wouldn't moonlight. Um, now, the, the effect of this, and we actually published the results. You can look at it. It was in academic medicine last year, if you just run my name. Um, the, uh, it, what it essentially created was a farm system for our faculty. So with recruiting, on, on average, we managed to recruit about five. And we only recruited the very best people. We recruited people who we thought would be eligible for faculty positions in a couple of years. So we didn't make any compromises. We looked at them as faculty recruits. And so they had to be at outstanding labs. They had to have outstanding publications and really good ideas of what they wanted to do. And we looked at it very, very carefully. Um, Stuart Kornfeld, who many of you know, who's a member of the National Academy, was one of the directors. Uh, and uh, Tony Muslin, a superb molecular cardiologist, was one of the other directors. And, and they gave, it was as rigorous as, as any of the faculty recruits that we did. Um, and so at the end of the day, we had recruited, we had a, 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 you took all of them, we had about 50 people uh, within this program who were in various labs uh, at the university uh, who were locked into the Department of Medicine. Um, and at the time that I left, we, we had about 13 junior faculty uh, who had been uh, recruited uh, to the department, physician scientists. Some of them had actually trained at Debbie Lenshaw, whom you will remember, absolutely outstanding, continuing to do outstandingly well. Um, and I think that if we had uh, not been able, to, it would have been much more difficult to attract them if they'd gone. These are people who would have gotten into the Brigham, the Mass General, UCSF. You know, to get them back uh, to come to St. Louis at the end of their training would have been much more difficult. So I, I know that there are elements of that, but I, I think all of you could listen to what I'm saying on that and take elements that you think may be helpful. Now, the other program actually turned out to be an interesting one as well. And that was sort of very different. This, and that one we called Mentors in Medicine. And Mentors in Medicine was, was meant for the residents. And the, the main rationale for that, so these were, some of them had had a scientific background, but most of them had just had a clinical background. They graduated from medical school. 
And um, so, so there were two reasons to do this program. The first was the hope that we would light a spark in some of them and that they would then want to do a, an academic career. But the main reason actually was because of evidence-based medicine. And my own personal view is that there's no better way to be able to read papers in a critical fashion than to do a research study yourself, to analyze the data, uh, to present it at a scientific meeting. And so um, the way in which the program worked uh, is that we got the faculty to volunteer, and pretty much everybody did. We put together a brochure in which each faculty member listed uh, his or her in scientific interests. And then we sent the brochures out to the incoming intern group. And uh, soon after they arrived, maybe in August, we, had a, uh, we, we would look at what their interests were, and we tried to hook them up with mentors. And then we had um, a, uh, an afternoon session where there was a lunch, and um, people could then meet faculty. Uh, so we invited all of the interns and all of the faculty who had signed up. We tried to sort of make marriages between the ones that we thought would fit. Uh, and sometimes we were successful in that, but sometimes people selected their own group. And then they were able to select a mentor. And every year we had an RFA. Uh, in which uh, we actually raised money from the pharmaceutical industry. There are not a lot of uh, there are a lot of restrictions now, as you know, in which in mechanisms for the pharmaceutical industry to support uh, academic medical centers. But this was one that we had no trouble raising money, and so we had an RFA. It was an NIH format uh, for a grant proposal that had to be written by the uh, applicant, the resident, obviously with a mentor. So it was a mentor-based program. Um, it followed the format, but you know, it was just three to four pages, not a long grant. Uh, we had a budget, so every year we put aside about, uh, as I said, that we raised between $150,000 and $200,000. Uh, people could apply for up to $10,000 to do a project. And so at the end of the day, you know, maybe 30 of the residents uh, in each class, uh, so two-thirds of them uh, were enrolled in this. And, um, Every year we had a, a research day where the residents presented. There were oral presentations, there were posters. Uh, we encouraged people to have to apply and send abstracts to the American College of Physicians, the local meeting, the local chapter, uh, which was held annually in the fall. Uh, and obviously a number of them wrote papers, a number of them presented at national meetings because you know they did uh, you know I, I, obviously the amount of time, that they had to devote to this was relatively limited. There was an opportunity to take some didactic courses as part of this uh, in clinical trial design and in basic biostatistics. Uh, and uh, the level of enthusiasm uh, amongst the residents for this was, was really fantastic. It was a great academic and intellectual enhancement to the program. Uh, the faculty enjoyed it. The residents enjoyed it. And when it came to applying for fellowship, it really gave them a great advantage because they were able to go to the interview and say, you know, this is my research project, this is what I did, I presented an abstract, we're writing a paper, I analyzed the data, you know, I did a statistics course. It made a big difference. So I, I know that a lot of those things are going on, and I'm, again, not telling you that anything that you don't know, but I'm just telling you how I think, what I think is valuable. Um, now, I think exposure to diverse role models uh, is also really important, and one does have to work at that, um, because uh, clearly the clinical load uh, is uh, borne in substantially by people who are general internists, which is obviously a spectacular role model, hospitalists, another spectacular role model. But I think that when people come to a place like the University of Chicago, they'd like to be exposed to a diverse uh, number of role models. So that should include people who are physician scientists, who are obviously spending most of their time in the lab and a modest amount of clinical work, uh, clinical investigators who are doing clinical trials, obviously health outcomes uh, researchers, health services, and people who are doing community-based research, as well as people who are cl uh, clinician educators. Uh, so I, I think the opportunity for young trainees uh, to really see and have personal interaction with people who are doing all these different types of uh, things, which is the, the, the breadth of what we do in the clinical departments, uh, is really a, I mean, that's one of the reasons that they come. And I, I think that one, it's in, it, it is a challenge these days to, to be able to get the residents to uh, have a consistent exposure, particularly to the physician scientists, uh, because many of them are not that evident on the wards. It's a tough 
sell sometimes to get them to attend. Um, and, you know, there are a variety of ways in which one can do it. What, what I would always, when people would come and say, you know, I, I don't want to attend on general medicine anymore, I'd bring them into the office and I'd say, you know, the reason that I think it's important uh, is for this. It's, it's not the manpower issue. It's not that we need you to see a few extra patients. Uh, it's that we want people to have role models. We want people to know that there are many different choices in academic medicine, and one of the choices that is viable is that you can be a physician scientist and you can still maintain clinical skills. Um, and it was actually remarkable that some of the physician scientists who spent a modest amount of time doing clinical work were really valued by the residents uh, because they brought a different perspective, not a better or a worse perspective, but just a different perspective. Um, and, and I think that's important. I've actually heard in other places of some creative programs. Um, at Penn, they started something called Physician Scientist Morning Report, uh, where um, Morning Report at regular intervals was led by a physician scientist, and the topic was not so much the clinical care of the patient, but the basic scientific underpinning of the disease. So, so I think, again, you know, I, I don't question that there's enormous creativity in this room amongst all of you, uh, but I, I would be thinking about ways in which you can, uh, if you're not already doing it, uh, you can ensure that uh, the trainees are exposed to multiple different role models. Now, professionalism is, uh, is obviously a very key issue, and I know that Holly has spent a lot of time, and it's a very central uh, thought at the University of Chicago. And if you haven't seen um, the article, you should look at it. Uh, it's in the Annals of Internal Medicine. It's the ABIM and the ABIM Foundation put together this really terrific uh, paper in 2002. Uh, you can see the reference there. And um, they uh, talk about uh, 10 different uh, professional responsibilities. Uh, professional competence, so clearly, your first job is to be competent. You have to be knowledgeable. So this is a, this is, we're in it for the long haul, and the students and residents have to understand that. Uh, as you know, we're now time-limited uh, or time-unlimited certification is, is a thing of the past, and uh, now we have to recertify, and it's a lifelong learning process. Uh, honesty with patients uh, is clearly a central uh, tenet of what we do. Um, when I was a medical student in South Africa, one wasn't honest with patients. We never saw it that way, but w if a patient had a bad diagnosis, there was often a pact between the doctor and the family that the patient wouldn't know. The, the family would know, uh, but the, and the doctor would know, obviously, but the patient wouldn't know, and, and we felt that we were saving the patient anguish, and you know they wouldn't be able to deal with the truth, and we kept it from them. Obviously, we don't do that anymore, and uh, we shouldn't have done it then, but that was what we did. Um, and I suspect that that was the same uh, here as well. Uh, sorry. Um, confidentiality, I don't think we need to say much more about that. I think we all know about HIPAA and the importance of that. Uh, maintaining appropriate relations with patients, so um, I think also self-explanatory. Uh, Improving the quality of care, and I, I think this is really a, a big enhancement uh, to programs now because uh, th there is a great focus uh, on improving quality of care. And, what I certainly found is that if we try to improve quality in one or other area, if the residents were not on board and the chief resident and the program director, it just didn't work. Uh, so if you want to make any change to the inpatient services and things are not working well or you want to change the, the flow of the patients or you know, whatever it is, um, the first people we would go to would be the chief residents. We'd get them on board. We'd get them to outline how can we make these changes. They usually had the best ideas. Um, and then we would, uh, you know, roll out the program, get the hospital involved, the nurses involved. And uh, once the residents were on board, things happened. The residents weren't on board, things didn't happen. Uh, so I think this is a, a great way uh, both to do research but also uh, to uh, impart the um, principle uh, that improving quality of care is an important uh, aspect of what they do professionally. Improving access to care clearly is a big uh, issue for us here, and we're all very committed to this. Uh, just distribution of finite resources, and that clearly is uh, one issue that we are going to have to deal with very much more directly. And I, I think we're going to have to start thinking uh, in a much more direct way than we currently are, knowing what the costs of the tests are that we order. Uh, we don't provide that information. We generally don't know that information. Uh, and uh, I, I, 
you know, I don't think that should be the sole consideration, but if there are two tests that are available and one costs $2,000 and the other costs $100 and you know that there's that difference, uh, it probably is important for the physician to be aware that they have to really think carefully about ordering the $2,000 test. And that's what it's going to come down to. Scientific knowledge we've spoken about, uh, maintaining trust by managing conflicts of interest. Um, we do have a conflict of interest policy at the University of Chicago, which actually looks pretty good to me, but I was just discussing um, yesterday uh, whether we need to make some of these disclosures more public, and I'm certainly in favor of that, and we'll be discussing that more broadly. Uh, as you know, most places are uh, putting public disclosures of individual relationships on their websites. Um, on the one hand, I'm very mindful of the fact that we need to engage in a constructive way with the pharmaceutical industry. We are obligated to find new treatments for patients, and we're not going to do it ourselves. But on the other hand, we have to manage these conflicts. So this is a, another set of uh, discussions that I think we'll have. And then a whole series of professional responsibilities. But I, I think for, the, for students and for residents, trainees, uh, to be um, well educated on each one of these uh, different categories is absolutely essential. Now, the other thing that is really interesting is that in this era of um, very high-tech approach to medicine, and you know, it's so easy to get a CT scan and an MRI scan, etc. cetera, um, what I have certainly found personally that trainees really uh, appreciate is somebody who will take them to the bedside and teach them basic bedside clinical skills, particularly physical diagnosis. The, the thrill of feeling a spleen or you know, hearing interesting lung sounds or telling the difference between consolidation and an effusion, uh, it, it really is uh, something that students appreciate uh, and residents appreciate enormously. Uh, you know, feeling the thyroid, we had many sessions with you know, glasses of water, feeling nodules and so on. And, and, and the, the, the time that is spent in doing that again is not uh, enormous, uh, but the uh, amount of the impact that it has uh, is really incalculable. So um, if you're not doing that routinely or consistently, I would really have you think about it. Um, it it's easy to do. It establishes a level of int intimacy with a clinical problem that really doesn't occur when the reliance is purely on technology. There's definitely something different. If you're sitting in the, in the, the side room and you look at the x-ray or you look at the CT scan uh, versus first going to the patient, eliciting the physical findings, uh, discussing with them what is the x-ray likely to show and then showing them the x-ray, it makes a huge difference. Practice improvement, uh, we spoke about. Um, the advent of the e electronic medical record uh, provides us with access to obviously an unprecedented amount of data relating to quality of care and patient safety and outcomes. Um, and uh, you can see the rest is self-explanatory. We, we also found that in the outpatient clinic, this was a huge benefit. So the, the, the outpatient resident clinic uh, was actually uh, the place where we first introduced the electronic medical record. So we had resident-specific data on a variety of different outcomes. And we actually started a project in diabetes um, in which we provided feedback to each of the residents of what, their, what the average hemoglobin A1C was of all of their patients, what it, what it was in comparison to other residents. Um, we kept electronic data. So one of the things that we found uh, dramatically was that at the outset, um, maybe less than 10% of the patients with diabetes were getting a foot exam. Um, and, you know, obviously that's not the standard of care. Everyone was easy to change. And so after a couple of sessions with the chief residents and with the, the program director, it went up to over 90%. Uh, people would comment how the clinic didn't smell so good because everybody had their feet or their shoes off. Um, but, but, you know, I, I, I think that the access to the, this electronic information uh, enabled us to provide a lot of insight, not just, I mean, in terms of the quality of care, but it impacted on the education of the residents. And so I think it's a really important idea as we, and I understand that the electronic medical record here is a work in progress, but it certainly is going to be implemented in the not too distant future, if, and I'm certainly an enthusiastic proponent of it. Uh, I think one needs to think about the creative ways in which one can use it uh, use these as learning tools uh, to improve both care and, uh, and education. Um, and uh, all of our residents should at least 
have the ability to participate in quality improvement projects uh, as part uh, of the training experience. Now, again, I, we don't need to spend too much time on this because I think this is a, a something that seems to be very robust at the University of Chicago. Uh, continuity clinics in a community setting, I think the opportunity to do that uh, is really a good idea. It certainly was a, a big help in our program. Um, and you know, some people wanted to be at the academic center and others wanted to be in the community. And I think if, if what you don't already have, if you can create such an opportunity, it would be terrific. Uh, overseas electives uh, is a huge uh, plus. And the, the residents are just fantastic uh, in terms of the creative things that they do in the community uh, in, a, in a volunteer mode. Now, um, obviously, there are still a lot of challenges uh, that, that, that we face. And, and one of them, which I'll talk about just for a few minutes, uh, is uh, the issue of work hours and inpatient coverage uh, and the role that uh, hospitalists uh, play in this. So, so I'm a big enthusiastic proponent uh, of uh, hospitalists, and I was from the beginning. I was a big advocate for it, uh, and I remember, Holly will remember, when we um, faced this issue at the ABIM Board of uh, Directors, uh, and uh, I think she and I were two of the biggest supporters. Um, and what we found is that the hospitalists in our department uh, played an enormously positive role in the education of the residents. Uh, it was not clear what would happen in the beginning, but the, the residents really appreciated uh, interaction with the hospitalists. Now, what we're obviously, when I trained, um, th there was no such thing as an uncovered service. It was sort of absolutely unheard of. I mean, every patient who came uh, to Mitchell Hospital uh, had a resident, was on a resident service. But obviously, because of the uh, combination of fixed residency slots and reduced uh, duty hours, uh, it's made it impossible in most hospitals uh, to cover all of the inpatients with resident-based services. Um, and, uh, you know, although I, I remember when, when I first proposed having a hospitalist program, I went to a faculty meeting, and there were lots of angry faculty. They, they got up and told me that this was going to be the end of the department, uh, that the teaching would go down, a whole variety of terrible things would happen, and it was actually uh, quite the opposite. So as you think about the new duty hour rules and the uh, impact that it's going to have on your programs, um, I would think very carefully about having more uncovered beds. Um, you know, again, we went through this analysis with the latest uh, changes that are going to come into effect at the end of June. And at least in medicine, it turned out um, that uh, the, the, the major impact uh, or the major problem that we encountered uh, was in the number of months in the ICU that were allowed by the RRC and by the ABIM. Um, and so in medicine, each year, the residents can do no more than two months in the ICU. And so it turns out that in order to fulfill all of these duty hour requirements, we could accommodate everything within the rest of the residency except that rule. But because of the you know, effect that ripples through the whole program, in order to uh, allow residents to meet the duty hour requirements and also have two months or less uh, in the ICU, we had to add a significant number of residents, like 15 residents. But we did an alternative analysis, and what we found that with one additional inpatient uh, pulmonary attending, a couple of incremental pulmonary fellows, uh, and some nurse practitioners, we were able to cover the ICUs uh, in, I think, a much more um, cost-effective way. Certainly, it was much less expensive, but I think from the standpoint of the program, uh, it was also better because the expansion in the residency that would have been required from that uh, would have been uh, you know, quite significant, and it had all sorts of downstream effects of having more program directors needed and uh, place in the residency, uh, places in the residency clinic, I mean rooms, uh, and a variety of other things. So, so I would, I would the, the basic point that I'm trying to make is that I, I would, Im I know you do have a, a strong hospitalist program, but I would philosophically embrace that. I think it's an extra extraordinarily positive uh, um, development in medicine. And uh, as we start to deal with these more restrictive laws and rules, and they may become more restrictive over time, uh, I think that to have uncovered services uh, with well-trained hospitalists uh, is a very good option in my view. Now, I think the other thing that, that I would really like people to be thinking about, particularly 
uh, for some of these special programs uh, is to coordinate, to have some level of coordination between the residencies. Uh, obviously, each residency is discrete and they have their own separate programs. But for example, um, in a physician scientist training program, there may be a big advantage uh, for uh, some of the departments to get together and have some level of joint recruitment, uh, some common uh, activities, so that it's not just uh, residents within that program uh, that are involved, that there's a broader community, a broader identity, that there's a sharing of mentors, a sharing of, you know, if there are didactic courses, and so on. Um, so share the infrastructure for research, community engagement, and global electives, you know, particularly the global electives. I, I don't know why, but I think in most places, um, there, there are lots of good activities going on in a completely uncoordinated way, and I, I'm not saying that that's the case here. Um, I think there's some level of coordination, but uh, a lot of independent um, activities, and, and I think that the extent to which one can coordinate them uh, will be uh, really helpful, but particularly if there's a critical mass of students that go to a, a place or a residence on a regular basis. Uh, and then, as I've said, uh, coordination, particularly of physician scientists. So, um, in conclusion then, I would just like to say that I think it's really an exciting time to be entering a career in biology and medicine. It's certainly an exciting time to be a, a teacher, and I think there are challenges and uh, opportunities that we've uh, never had before. Uh, and to be at a world-class institution like the University of Chicago obviously provides a lot of opportunities for world-class training. So um, I'm very impressed with what I've seen already, and hopefully things will get even better at some, you know, as, as we move on. So thanks very much for the invitation, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, you know, I, I, I honestly don't know. Um, we had, again, we discussed that a lot at the ABI and board. Um, I certainly hope not. I think that the training is actually long enough. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, uh, and, and, you know, I've, I've written about this. You, you may have seen that we did have an editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine in which we basically said that, um, I, at least to my reading of the situation, uh, adequate studies have not been done to determine how many hours it really is that a resident uh, can actually be on duty. Um, so I would hope that this doesn't happen, but if it gets down to a point where there's so few hours done in a week, we may have to, to give people adequate training. And as I think you know, in some parts of the world, uh, in the United Kingdom, where I think it's down to around 56 hours, um, it's been written about that surgery residents just don't get exposure to enough cases. And if the hours go down long enough, uh, particularly in procedural specialties uh, and uh, you know, things like ICUs, uh, we may have to. But I, I hope that that won't happen. And I hope that if they do make additional requirements that uh, you know, really good studies will be done uh, so that we don't just uh, do things because we think it's a good idea. We do things because the data demonstrates that we have to do that. Um, you know, look, I, I don't know what's going to happen uh, down the line. I, I think it's really important uh, that we still, that, that physician scientists and people who are doing clinical research have a good grounding in clinical medicine. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I trained in South Africa where clinical bedside skills and clinical uh, training was really held in very high esteem, and uh, I think it's stood me in very good stead for my entire career, and I've seen many other examples of that. So I would hope that we would not specialize to such a great extent, but you know, I, I don't know that I can foresee into the future. I think that to have a, a balance, I think that the special role of a physician scientist is that they, if they have a strong understanding of, of medicine and disease, and then a strong understanding of science, I think that's the correct balance, and we're probably about right. So that's my own personal view. 
Well, I'm certainly going to do my, my part. Um, I think we have to, uh, no, I think we have to recognize people who are teachers. I think things like the academy and, uh, you know, appointing people to fellowships and uh, to being masters of, uh, of the academy is very important. Uh, I think, uh, you know, supporting people who are outstanding educators, um, you know, just making sure by what we do when it comes to promotion, taking that into account for people who are doing, you know, I, I sort of see um, teaching as falling into one of two categories. The, the, the first is everybody should do some level of teaching. Uh, you know, so I don't think that there should be a discussion as to, uh, you know, should I teach the medical students when I'm in clinic? Should I, uh, te you know, interact with the residents and being on service? I think that, that one of the, the requirements for being at the University of Chicago should be there should be an expectation that you do some level of teaching, not an overwhelming amount. And then there is a second category of people who are spending a substantial amount of their time uh, teaching, and they, sh they in particular should be recognized. But, but it, it, should take, it should come into consideration for everybody. So, I mean, if you have any other suggestions of how we should go about it, you can send me a note, and I'll be happy to uh, consider it. <laughs> Okay, other questions? Okay, very good, Dan, thanks. Thank you very, very much.